<laughs> um, so I think as we explained um, yesterday, so after six minutes, there'll be a light tap of the bell, and then after eight minutes, then there will be a slightly louder uh, uh, tap of the bell, and um, so that means you guys have to stop talking. So at the very least, you know, this only lasts for eight minutes, so that's fine. Um, and um, I think we can question. Yeah. So after after the eight minutes, then there's questions for two minutes, um, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, yeah. But first, we have Don, who will start us off. So. You can. Uh, you can start now. So, good morning, everyone. As you've heard, I'm Don Berger. I'm from the University of Cape Town, where I'm at the QGAS laboratory, so quantum gravity and strings. And um, I'm just going to talk about some work with my collaborators, Nathan Moynihan, and Jeff Morgan, and Amanda Weltman. It's a wonderful world of extended atmospheres. Um, so, first off, before we get into the details, we need to ask ourselves why amplitudes. Because traditionally, amplitudes are hard. I mean, either you have huge amounts of diagrams, you need to calculate Feynman diagrams, or if you take, for example, low energy QCD, you have extremely difficult, intricate diagrams to calculate. So, as an example of this, um, the tree level four point amplitude for gravity has around 500 terms that you need to compute. Um, this was some poor PhD student's job in, uh, in the 60s. Um, but, uh, now, so computers solved this for the most part, but I mean, even if we consider that, amplitudes are built for specific purposes. We have two particles coming in from infinity, interacting at a specific point in space-time, very local effect, and then we walk to infinity. So it's very limited to what it can do. But luckily, we have some new advances recent, now yeah, mostly recent, um, most notable of which is the Bertoka Charles O'Fink and Witten recursion relations. So, what we have here is that you can take any higher point amplitude and factorize it into two sub amplitudes, so AL and AR, connected with a propagator. Um, does make sense? I mean, we consider S and T channel amplitudes for four point. Uh, but the beauty of this is that if we complexify one of the one momentum on each of the sub amplitudes, um, we can use complex analysis to determine this higher point amplitude from the lower point sub amplitudes. So if we do this enough and we break down our, our amplitudes to lower and lower order, all we actually need is the three point. And this can be uniquely fixed um, by the little group in 4D for massless particles. The little group is U1. So what we have here is that three-point amplitude, lambdas are spinner variables, um, Hs are the helicity of the specific particles, and T is the interaction constant. So um, using dimensional analysis, we can fix these three-point amplitudes. And from that, using recursion relations, we can then build any higher point amplitude we could possibly want to calculate. Um, so this leads us to the point that we don't need a specific theory, derive Feynman rules, and then calculate the amplitude. We just need to know the particle content of our capturing process. So this really simplifies these types of calculations. Um, this also leads to many in the amplitude community say that to know everything about a theory, all you need to know is the amplitude. That should know you should be able to see all phenomenological effects from only this. So, as an example, some recent work that I, that I did with my collaborators, um, we calculate gravitational light bending. So, in GR, anyone who's had GR should know this, um, it's a really simple process. You have Schwarzschild geometry, so a massive object. You have a light ray passing it. Um, you calculate the null geodesic for your geometry, and from that, taking the geometric's optic limit, you can find the angle of deflection for your light ray, um, as given there. But this is a large process, so we wouldn't think amplitudes are applicable. But modeling the black hole or star as a scalar, and that interacting via graviton with a photon um, in the T channel, we can, using these new methods, very easily calculate the same angle in the appropriate limit. So geometric optic limits, 
GL corresponds to the hyperbola limit in this case, and we found this. But this is a simple process. We would like to find out if we could do this for more complicated things. So to that end, um, this was an angle calculation, which is well suited to scattering amplitudes. But we'd like to go a bit further than this. So the first question, no, not inherently suited to this. So the first question we'd like to ask is, can you calculate something like uh, the Shapiro time delay, which also corresponds to, to a light ray moving past a massive body? We have some warping in space-time, so we can pick up this time delay in the light traveling past it. But what's again scattering amplitudes is a specific point in space-time. So could this be calculated using these methods? Um, another one is extended effects. So say, for example, you have light ray passing through the ergosphere of a curved black hole, and you have some angular momentum imparted on this photon. How do you describe that using these methods? Um, so, in this case, we need to introduce some form of scale, and the way to do this is to use ladder diagrams. So, for Shapiro time delay, this has been done using standard Feynman calculations. And what you do is you have your two particles, your scalar black hole and your photon, and interacting with a graviton. And you start by building, adding more graviton interactions. So you end up with this infinite series of loop ladder diagrams, um, which is all right, has some completely special technical details, but um, what this basically means is that it mimics a small particle moving past a larger object because you have these multiple exchanges of gravitons. Um, so uh, we introduce the scale in this way. And, um, but these ladder diagrams are extremely intricate and difficult to calculate. So this still only works in the icon limit where we can basically take all, all the, the outer particle propagates, so our rails of our ladders, we can take them on shell. There's no need to, to calculate them in loops as well. Um, and we're trying to see whether these new modern methods we can relax. The ideal would be able to relax these kinds of limits. But even just finding a simpler way of calculating these could be interesting. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions? Speaker? Yes. Can, can you say a little more about what do you mean that you can re replace a black hole with a scalar? <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, a slight notion. But I mean, you can take a um, black hole during swatch out black hole, has no charge, has no spin. So we model it in that way. It is, you know, we just take it as a small scalar particle and take that problem, but there's no real significant meaning to modeling it as a scalar. Um, I mean, black hole is supposed to be like, uh, it's a localized but finite size object. And yes, when you consider yes. part, like, grab, like, yeah. gate go down and the scalar thing, yeah. you have to specify the initial momentum of the scalar, final momentum of the scalar, what does all these correspond to in the black hole picture? What is this translation? No, so your, your energy of the scalar, we work in the, since we're working in this very um, mass center of mass energy limit, your black hole is state, your scalar is stationary and the, the rest mass energy is corresponds to the mass of the black hole, the energy of the black hole. There is no sort of thing. It is, that's one of the strange things that we've come across that why does this work? Why can we model this extended object as a single particle? Which is still a bit strange. We don't fully understand that. That's what does what does the radius of black hole becomes? Radius of black hole becomes in terms of scalar? I don't know. That's that's the it's there is no radius. Okay, so I think let's leave it there and...
Okay, next speaker is James. Uh, hi, my name is uh, James Shian and uh, from the University of Petwetes Rand. Um, I'm working with uh, Kevin Ponsky. So what I'll be presenting here uh, is the work that I'm doing for my second year PhD, uh, studying higher derivative gravity theories. So I'll just start by giving a brief introduction uh, of the work that we did before, and then actually just get into the small introductions of uh, linearized gravity, and then uh, introduce critical gravity and massive gravity theories in four dimensions, and then just look at uh, the thermodynamics and the continuation. So on the ADS, um, for, for the ADS first side, Black hole, we know it's given uh, by this. Uh, sorry, there's no minus there. So this comes from uh, the, the Hilbert Einstein uh, action. Um, but the, the theories that we're interested in are uh, theories that have higher derivative uh, curvature terms. Uh, you, you can see that the Ricci terms and the Ricci scalar. Uh, because we're actually looking for for higher derivative non shell black holes. So if you solve, if you vary that uh, action, you actually get uh, these equations of motion. And from this uh, paper, we, we're actually considering uh, when you have beta is equal to zero, uh, and then we actually determined uh, two branches of uh, non shell black holes. Uh, but then now, what we're focusing on is just tuning on the, the cosmological constant uh, because we also want to study uh, non child ADS. Uh, so for linearized gravity, you just expand your your your, your metric uh, under the, the the ADS background, uh, which is given by by that. So you linear, so you expand up to first order. Uh, so when you do that, these are the these are the equations of motion. Uh, then your curvature terms or Einstein terms are given by, by that. Uh, so we want, we want to solve for, 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 for h mu nu. Uh, there are different gauge conditions that you can choose. But So when we choose this gauge um, and take the trace of the equations of motion, and then you get this equation, and then this equation, you can actually do some analysis uh, having two cases where you can take uh, the parameter alpha is equal to minus three beta, or or you can, uh, and then that actually will lead to, to h being equal to zero. So this equation actually describes a propagating uh, massive scalar mode. Uh, so for, for case one, where you take alpha is minus three beta, uh, your equations of motion becomes uh, like this, and then if you just take this term and substitute beta, uh, yeah, substitute alpha in terms of beta, uh, this is what you, you get. Uh, so you here your h will, will, will describe a massless gravity. So for critical gravity, that's when your massive scalar modes become actually massless. Uh, so if you, from here, you can see that uh, since the mass is supposed to be, uh, the mass of the, the black hole is supposed to be positive, you can actually determine the allowed values of beta. And then if you take uh, beta to, to a minimum, which is uh, that, and then this is actually now a theory of, of massless gravitons. So basically the whole point of this is just linearizing your equations of motion and then uh, perform some plots on how on how those uh, scalar modes actually uh, behave, and then you, you go back and then you solve the full set of equations of motion using numerical methods, and actually try to determine those black holes. Uh, then for for case two, if alpha is different from from minus three beta, this is the full set of equations of motion. So from here you can just see that you. You can only just dive in and use numerical methods to, to, to solve it. And then if we, when we look at 
uh, play, uh, playful thermodynamics. So here I just uh, introduced or just showed how you calculate the, the entropy using the world's formalism. Uh, you know that you need a, a, a rank two tensor um, with, your, with your Lagrangian there and so forth. And, and Q uh, is actually anti-symmetric. So in this case, when you vary the, the, the Lagrangian with, with, your, with your Riemann tensor, uh, the, the, the entropy is actually defined by that uh, integrating on the area of the, the horizon. And then when you do when you do that calculation, this is this is what you get, and then this is just your, your second tens, and then your L here would be uh, the normal at the horizon. Uh, so on the ADS background, so this is Q, and then this is actually the, the entropy of, uh, of of your black holes, and then for critical gravity, you know, you just have to substitute alpha, and then this is uh, what you get. So in conclusion, so we need to solve the full set of equations of motion, and then using numerical methods by uh, by deflecting your 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 your, your horizon radius by some small parameter, and then actually determine those parameters so that you can get your, your natural shell black holes. Uh, and then you also have to check if your, your ADS natural shell black holes obey the demo, uh, demo dynamic, uh, laws of thermodynamics. Uh, and then you can also uh, perform some asymptotic expansion uh, just to, to, to match your, your numerical results to, to that asymptotic expansion. Uh, so yeah, this is where... Determining which parameters, alpha and beta. Yeah. Oh, so you can, I mean, you can show. Firstly, we we just chose beta to be equal to zero, just to simplify the equations of of motion that we have to solve. But I mean, you you don't really lose any information when you set like alpha is equals to half. But yeah. So you can just choose values that um, you don't really lose any information. Okay. Anyone else? So, so uh, there was an update to the schedule or something like that. Okay, the next speaker is Kahiso. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Kahiso Mataba and I'm a PhD student with uh, Jao Rodriguez at Perth University. And today I want to briefly talk about the closed radio sector of the multi-matrix model. Um, so in my talk, I will give a quick introduction, um, and then I'll quickly talk about a one-dimensional conformal quantum mechanics and ADS2 space time. And I will talk about the one-dimensional conformal quantum mechanics that we get from our matrix model, our multi-matrix model. And also, I'll talk about the two-dimensional background that we get from our multi-matrix model um, and how those two are related. And maybe I'll, I'll quickly talk about what I'm currently doing. So as we all know, the ADS CFT is, uh, is a major advancement in, um, in string theory in us trying to understand um, field theories in quantum gravity and variation. Um, and for our work, we are um, uh, particularly interested in the ADS2 CFT1 case. And um, what uh, we're trying to do is see if um, a one-dimensional conformal quantum mechanics um, can be possibly uh, dual to a two-dimensional um, um, background. And so um, I'll be looking at the 1D conformal quantum mechanics, which arises from this matrix model and see if the 2D gravity um, um, background that I get from this model also if it's gravitational uh, to, 
And maybe this will be an example of the ADS2 CFT1. Um, so for uh, conformal quantum mechanics, we have an action that, look like this, that looks like this. And our fields only depend on time. And this action is invariant under these three generators here, um, the Hamiltonian dictations and special conformal um, operator. And these uh, three operators are satisfied the SO2 comma R um, algebra. Now what we can do is we can have, we can construct more convenient operators given by L123 here as shown here. And these operators um, satisfy the SO1, 2 algebra. And so this uh, just shows a, a local isomorphism between these two groups um, uh, in this case. Um, now the uh, Hamiltonian in this, uh, uh, in this system it doesn't have a discrete spectrum. So what we can do is we can just make a quick uh, change, uh, change of variables and actually will change with a constant. And what we end up with is a single part particle quantum mechanics with an imagined potential um, as shown here. Now this imagined potential is very interesting for our study as, well, as I'll show later. Uh, now for ADS2 space time, we know that uh, the space time has three isometries that's shown here. And these isometries also satisfy the SO 1 comma 2 algebra. Um, we can express these uh, um, generators uh, in terms of Poincaré coordinates. And then we can then move to the boundary and see if we can match um, these generators with those of the one dimensional conformal quantum mechanics. And we see that we uh, actually can. Um, and so this uh, provides the basis of you know, this motivation that you could have an example of um, an ADS2 CFT uh, one uh, correspondence between these two theories. So just to quickly um, um, show you guys what I mean by a radial sector in a matrix model. Um, uh, if you consider your complex matrix Z here, um, you could describe it um, in the usual way or you could um, write it as a product of a a uh, Hermitian uh, matrix and a unitary matrix. And then you can further decompose that Hermitian matrix into another uh, unitary matrix and a diagonal uh, matrix given by that little R red. And then you will have your DZ uh, given by this expression here. Now, what we do is define the line element DS squared as trace DZ data by DZ and you get this expression here. So this allows you to have um, a metric in the system. So when I say radial sector, I mean um, only the part that has to do with DR in this, uh, in this system. So if I have a multi-matrix model with um, D emission matrices uh, given by the Hamiltonian here, um, the radial part of the Hamiltonian is given by this expression here. And uh, as you can see, we are, in this case, we also have this imagined potential from the one dimensional conformal quantum mechanics. And we see that this equation here gives us, uh, 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 it's a sum of single particle, I mean, of, of, of Fermian Hamiltonians. And this is in D plus one dimensions, related to the D, the number of, of matrices in this model. Um, so what we can do is we can use second quantization to describe this many body um, system and what we do with these uh, second quantized operators we can make it a, a field definition and what we end up with is our generators in this form with the, um, the Fermian Hamiltonian and um, other operators now in one dimension. So in this process what we have done is essentially reduce the problem to a one dimensional um, quantum mechanics. <coughs> And um, these generators still um, satisfy the SO2 comma algebra. So now when we move to the uh, connective field theory, um, we can express our multi-matrix model with our fields phi. And what we um, have is our Hamiltonian in this um, formalism uh, given by this expression here. And also in this um, um, 
formalism, we still have that emerging um, potential from the one dimensional conformal quantum mechanics. And, um, but in this formalism, we have to include this Lagrange multiplier to NPR. And this is to uh, uh, enforce the eigenvalue constraint in, um, in the system. Um, but it turns out that this Lagrange multiplier um, breaks the SO2 um, symmetry of the system that we found in the, in the other formulations. Now what we can do is we can take the larger limitings uh, in the, in the, uh, in this uh, system and we use the set point approximation here to find the solution for the two-dimensional background. And what we can do is we can consider our fluctuations about this background. And by doing this, we find um, this Lagrangian here, which leads us to uh, a, a metric for this two-dimensional background um, that we have from this system. And this is the two-dimensional background that we consider as a possible dual um, um, to the one-dimensional conformal uh, uh, quantum mechanics that we find uh, from the dimensional reduction. So um, as I said before, um, this Lagrange multiplier term uh, breaks this SO2 comma R algebra that we had before. Is it in the That's it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, is there any effective action for the breaking of this Um. No, I don't think I haven't. We haven't been uh, able to work that out. Yeah. So that's a question. Yeah. So, single one quantum mechanics matrix uh, model is known to be a dual to uh, two dimensional string theory. Yeah. Uh, but the potential, uh, I mean, but uh, the background is well depends on of course potential. But for the trivial case, the background is a linear dual and not a yes. So, can you comment? on that, uh, what's the difference between your case and the uh, usual single one? Um, they, um, again, in simple terms, when you can produce this two-dimensional background, but in that process you can continue and actually make a change of variables um, in the time, and you will then get your, um, the background that you talked about. So um, they actually are related, um, but yeah, it's a simple process of a, a coordinate redefinition, and you will find that the two are actually so that's how they relate. So do you expect uh, the graph, uh, your graph theory or your model is two dimensional string theory or something else? It's something like a low energy limit of that. Yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs> Next speaker is Leila. Now, uh, because you have n squared integrals, you see that this 
first correction term isn't doesn't have any one over uh, n. Uh, so it's not suppressed by one over n. So in the large n limit, you will have some order one error that's uh, uh, correcting this classical error. Now, if you study eigenvalue dynamics, uh, you'll only have n integrals to study. So now all your fluctuation terms will be suppressed by one of n, so in the large n limit, you're going to reproduce this classical value. And so this is an indication that you'd want to use eigenvalue dynamics and not this matrix model to reproduce supergravity. So you might uh, want to know how do you go from matrix model correlators to eigenvalue correlators. And this has been studied for the single matrix model. And um, the result is this non-trivial Jacobian appearing here, which is a product of two van der Maan determinants. This anti-symmetry isn't surprising because we know that single matrix model, eigen, the eigenvalue dynamics of a single matrix model should correspond to free fermions. So we really get this idea that uh, eigenvalue dynamics and supergravity are linked. And this link is so promising that we want to go ahead and uh, look at a two matrix model and see if we can find that link there as well. Even though for a two matrix model you wouldn't expect to be able to reproduce correlators with eigenvalue dynamics because your matrices are not simultaneous and not recognizable. However, we expect, uh, we think that it should be there, so we're going to try and see if there's some sector in the two matrix model that can be reproduced with eigenvalue dynamics. And we think that the operators that we should be able to match should be hot BPS operators. So now, uh, the idea that we had is we must take the single matrix uh, model formalism uh, and, the, uh, and the way we go from uh, the matrix model to eigenvalue dynamics and um, reproduce that for the two matrix model. So we have to calculate this, uh, this Jacobian that's associated with that. Um, and we come up with these generalized van der Maan de determinants, and the um, Jacobians are product of these two. And we have to check this. So we calculate the correlators in the matrix model and in the eigenvalue description with uh, that Jacobian that I showed you, and we find that we can get an exact matching for the half BPS operators. So, um, for example, this is a kind of operator that we looked at. For, it's a half BPS operator, and we computed the matrix model, uh, a matrix model correlator and an eigenvalue cap correlator, and you kind of get an exact matching uh, when the number of fields you have are bigger than n or, or equal to n. And this shouldn't surprise you because we're looking at supergravity, so you should have um, the number of fields should, you have should be large enough to warp the space time. You shouldn't be able to expect to be able to reproduce. Um, small operators. Something else that we checked, and this was really cool that we got this right, was uh, this this uh, correlator here at the bottom. And this isn't BPS, so you think, okay, maybe you wouldn't get it right. But when you look at it, you see that it's a product of BPS operators. So this is something like a many point function of gravitons. And if you want to reproduce supergravity with eigenvalue dynamics, then you should get something like this correct. And we do. So um, you know you can really see that there's a sector of this two matrix model that is uh, reproduced by eigenvalue dynamics, and I've touched on the link between the eigenvalue dynam dynamics and supergravity. If you want to see that in more detail, you can take a look at our paper uh, where we, we make this link more explicit, um, and there's some more checks uh, in there if you want to have a look at it. And the idea going forward is that we'd like to. Uh, calculate, look at more half BPS operators in the two matrix model and see if we can um, match it. And then eventually start to include more fields and see is there some sector in uh, N equals or super young moles that is um, uh, due to supergravity. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, but we have any video book in your matrix model? No, we haven't done that yet. What does BPS like mean then? Half BPS, so uh, half your, you have half the, the supersymmetries of uh, your normal um, of BPS. So some but your model is purely bosonic, right? Yes. So 
So yeah. what that doesn't have supersymmetry. Where is the supersymmetry? If you have supersymmetry, you have to have fermionic variables. No? Yeah, that's true. But that you, you, you add them, uh, you, you add it eventually, but you, you don't need to talk about fermion fields to talk about previous geometries. Okay, another question. Can you, can you go back to your uh, slide where you wrote down the action? The probably faster Sorry, second slide. Go back further. Uh, no, no, just a bit further. Where do you have written down the action? action. You have multi matrix action. Uh, With two matrix models, you have an action, right? Oh, uh, no, right. it's a car, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, so this, so, is, this is a zero dimensional. I just, um, we looked at uh, zero dimensional toy model. Right. Model, so in, in this dot dot, do you have like uh, interaction oh, so terms as well, which uh, makes no, the so this is some correlator that you will be able to write it down in terms of, um, so this is some observable you want to calculate that you'll be able to write down in terms of purely the, eigen, the eigenvalues eventually on, on, the, on that side. So it's some, some, product, some, uh, some trace of a product of uh, uh, Z and Y fields, and you need. But you, you will use like mixed operators as well. Yes. So, um, so for example, if you see uh, in this slide, this ah. J case, this is for the Z fields or Y fields. Ah, okay, you want both of them. Right. Okay. You see this, this like rotation. Oh. Well, I have a related question because when you have Y and Z, you can. Study more general based on one half is it. So that's uh, some descendants of them. Uh, well, basically, they, they trace the. Yes. So that, and if you want to just describe this, just trace the, you don't have to introduce uh, two matrices. So. Okay. So we want so we want to look at the two matrices. So we want Z and, and Y field, but we want to build half BBS operators. And the way we thought to do that is we know that something like, if you just look at this, this is half BPS, but we want to introduce Y field. And the way we do that is we, we use this rotation to replace the Z fields with Y fields, and that's, that, that will still be half BPS. Uh, I guess it's not, this doesn't reproduce all your half BPS operators, but this is some way to get some of them. <coughs> so uh, that's that's why it looks like, is that, is that what you're asking? No, my question oh. is, uh, so you're going to do something <coughs> more general than half BPS? Because to me, it's a half bit piece. If you really in this half bit piece, you don't have to introduce Y, but now you have Y. Oh, yes, so so we're in this quarter PPS sector, but we're just looking at the half PPS operators within, within there. Is it difficult, or is it just not good? Well, it's difficult. it was difficult to figure out what that's what we needed to do. But the, this, um, for example, something like this, this isn't too difficult if you try to get more general, it becomes difficult, yes. All right, should we thank our speaker? You're right. Yeah. <laughs> So shall we have Luca and then Bavanello and then we take maybe a five ten minute break and then we'll, we'll come back. So yeah, our next speaker is Luca and start when you're ready. So this is a bit of a fun side project that myself, my school and other people have been doing. Um, it's on the propagation of fire using conformal field theory. About last year, my school advisor attended a, a, a talk at the Science and Cocktail Evening in Johannesburg at BITS. And this lady was talking about fire in terms of her work. She's in the, I think she's in the, social, she's in the science field. I'm not really sure what she does, but um, she studies fires. And she studies propagation of fires. And she said something quite interesting. She said that if you look at the size of fires versus the frequency of fires, more specifically the log, there's a region where you get some kind of what they call scale invariance. Um, and it's quite an interesting thing, you know, to have scale invariance in the fires, meaning that the size of the fire is not too dependent on the number of fires you have, like that. Now, the setup that she has is that take a group, take a plot of land, sort of pour it off into these, block, these boxes, and each point, if there was a fire in that year, you assign a value of one, if there was no fire in the other year, you have a value of zero. 
So what you get is a 2D grid with binary entries, ones or zeros. All right? Now, keep this in mind. If we look at a scale invariant theory of two dimensions with the added point career symmetries, we have a conformal field theory. We have conformal symmetries that they go with that. And the beautiful thing about conformal invariances is that it fixes a form of two point and three point functions. Um, so this gives us a very nice tool to study certain things. And the icing model is a particular toy model that one uses to study critical point behavior. And we use these two point functions, three point functions on this IC model, and we actually know what the form should look like, we know what the critical exponents should look like. We, we know a lot already. Uh, the IC model itself is, again, just a two-dimensional grid. Um, it has spins which can be aligned, or, uh, aligned with or against the magnetic field. Um, and so depending on the temperature of the system, you have these different behaviors. So you can see that you have values of 1, minus 1. But the idea here is that you have a two-dimensional model with binary entries, some scale invariants. And so the idea is that using the correlation functions, let's apply this. Let's apply this to our fire data, see what we get. Hopefully we can get something very similar. Now, the two-point two correlation functions is just, you know, you have pick two points in the grid, um, i and j, separated by some distance r. And we just move that along the grid. We take the average correlation for that particular distance. And what you get is what we expect, and this is again from what we have in two dimensions, that the correlation function should have this form where alpha is the critical exponent and uh, xi is the correlation length. Now, at the critical point, uh, we have the correlation length going to infinite, right? And so what we have is this is the, the general form of the equation. Of course, for three-point functions, it's very similar. We're just adding an extra side k, all right? But the form is very similar. In addition, we know how to relate. We know how to relate these critical exponents. So with this, Tool, we're going to then apply it to our fire data. Um, just to, before we get to get a bit of intuition of these correlation functions, let's just see what it would look like on some basic examples. Take a random grid. All right, one, zero is randomly distributed. What we expect, of course, is zero correlation. Right, we don't expect any correlation here. And in fact, this is what we get. This is just the average correlation versus function of distance. On a slightly different grid, this is a checkered grid. So here you have taken two points, any points, you either have one three combinations. You have two black grids, white and a black grid, or two white grids. So the average correlation is one of two possible values, one or minus one. Alright? And in fact, that's what we get. Oops. We get one or minus one. So this, 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 these functions give us some property of the, the structure of our data. A bit more interesting one, take a random distributed grid, okay, with inverse probability, meaning um, the weight of probability. As we go down, the probability of having a 1 or a black grid becomes less. The correlation function should be anti-correlated as the distances increase, as we expect. As we get further and further, the probability of having black and white um, change. And in fact, that's what we get. The correlation function has chosen sort of an anti-correlated behavior as we increase in distance. So it's, this is sort of, it's doing what we expect. Now look at the IC model. So this is the, close to the critical points, across the critical temperature, particularly for computational reasons, when you're at the critical point, computational time becomes exponentially longer. It becomes very difficult to get up. So this is very close to the critical um, temperature. And using our correlation functions, right, we will have something with a correlation length because we're not at the critical point. So we don't expect it to, to have an infinite correlation length. Um, what's interesting is, of course, the IC model. We expect this is the value we expect for the critical exponent for the IC model. In fact, we get it. And this is nothing surprising. This is just very standard um, sort of results. Now, this is our field. This is Botswana. Right? This is a section of Botswana. The black represents a fire, and this is just an overlap of the actual, the actual map. What you see, which is very interesting, is that the data fits really nice. It's not model. We have the same function, and it's just a side-by-side -side comparison. All right. It's just coincidental that our values match up quite nicely. It's not the same across the different years. What we have is we have 12 years for Botswana and 12 years in the Pesco region for Kazakhstan. But it just, it's really nice to see that the, the model fits, the data fits our model very, very well, or vice versa. Now, there's something to be said that, of course, in the IC model, this is a relationship we know it holds. For our data, when we calculate the three-point functions, it doesn't quite hold. And it's not, it was, would have been nice, but it's quite just to be expected. You know, you don't have translational variance is, is broken in this case. In the sense that, you know, as wind blows, sure, the fire will more likely to burn in a particular direction. 
All right? And in fact, we can see this using what we call directional correlations. Directional correlations is just the correlation function that's chosen in directions. All right? So if, for example, this is the same inverse grid, we're going to look at, we're going to look at directions 90 degrees and 0 degrees. Clearly, we expect the inverse correlation, the anti-correlation behavior to be along this direction. That's what we get. So we can see the inverse correlation is related to degrees to angles which are, of course, along 90 degrees or along this direction. And we just have a constant correlation behavior over here. Applying this to our actual uh, <coughs> fire data, Botswana, so look at degrees at angles at 0 and 90 degrees. You can see this is the two different plots. Now, there's a, the different, the same form of the function, but the difference comes in maybe the exponent or the correlation length. And as a comparison, here we have distances of 145 degrees and 55 degrees. There clearly is a difference. There's something driving the fire in a particular direction. And using these directional correlations, we can just, you know, you choose all, you can just map out every single angle, and you can see how does the fire correlation depend on the angle. And this gives them some very interesting ways of, of looking at the occurrence of the fire. So ultimately, with greater finite time scale in the sense that the data we have is over a scale of, a scale of one year. Clearly, a fire which happened in January is not likely to be causing a fire which happened in December. So it would be nice to get the um, data from one month basis. And you can, get, you can say something more, your results will be more strong. You can say something more specific about um, the data. Then secondly, these directional correlations can start, talking, can start telling you how weather patterns influence you know, fire. If you get the weather data, you can start saying, okay, well, with wind directions are in a particular direction. As you can see, the direction correlations are also in the direction of the wind. So we can start telling, well, how much of a factor does wind play in the fire? And what would be nice, we still need to, we like to compare to the current models. And taking the variables of the two point and three point correlation functions, the, we can see exactly how they look. Yeah. Thank you. Questions for Luca? Yes. Uh, how big is your grid for the fire data? So the, like the, the flat size. Yep. This is a the total the big grid of the whole region of Botswana is about two thousand by two thousand units, and each unit is a fifty by fifty meter plot of land. Okay. So it's about two 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 kilo, two thousand kilometers by two thousand a thousand kilometers by thousand kilometers roughly. What we have here is just a small section of area which is, um, this is about 600 units by about 1,200 units. Um, so it just covers the region here of the game reserve, the Kalari game reserve. Uh, the region of the Kazakhstan ones are much larger, so yeah, that's about the size of the, this is 450 units, you can see that's about the scale of 450 units, which each unit represents a 50 by 50 meter plot of land. So is there any chance you can get more fine-grained data? Like, so apparently, so the correct. The limit somehow, yes, so happens? she does have, more of this data, which we can, it, it, that's the beauty that just give us the data and we can apply this analysis. So we would come up with a way of analyzing the data, and no matter what data they give us, we can apply it. This is what we have so far, and this is what the basis from where we started. All right, let's thank Luca again. Um, I'm going to be talking about the critical ON vector model and its relation to higher spin. This is work that I did with my supervisor, Professor João Rodrigues at FEDS. Now, um, the reason why we are really studying higher spins is because of a, a, a conjecture due to Klebanov and Polyakov, which basically says that the free ON vector model should be dual to Vasilyev type A higher spin theory with conformal dimension equals to 1. Similarly, if the, um, for the critical O-N vector model, um, the same conjecture will hold that uh, it will be dual to Vasiliev uh, type A higher spin theory, but the conformal dimension will be given by two. Now, um, this goes to back to what Prof. Ferrari was saying during the school. 
the term models are relatively very simple. So what we want is a tractable version of the ATS CFT correspondence, and this, uh, this gives us such an example. And another thing is that unlike the standard uh, ATS CFT, this is a, a weak, weak kind of a duality. Um, evidence for the conjecture, um, for example, there was a seminar work by Robert Demelokov, uh, Robert, uh, Robert Demelokov, Joel Rodriguez, and Antal Jelinski, where they uh, gave a reconstruction of the bulk. Um, another example, it's a seminar work by Guillaume where they computed three point functions. And another example was the work by Guillaume and Klebanov, where they computed the free energy at one loop. Um, this is a summary. So initially, this for the uh, free scalar, this was work done by uh, uh, Klebanov and Polyakov in Initially, um, very, um, it was also done for the critical uh, fermion, fermion, which is the cross level model by Robert Lee and Per Sander. Now, this is the Lagrangian for the ON vector model. It looks simple, it looks uncomplicated. Now, what we want to do, and this is provided by the JVC circuit of relative theory, you want to rewrite this theory in terms of uh, the invariance of that theory. For example, in QCD, this might be the Wilson groups. Um, for the matrix model, this might be traced to the M, N, which what Kakiso did, so that uh, you can replicate them and write it as traced to the uh, exponent of IKM. Um, but for the ON vector model, the, the invariants are just the bilocals, which uh, I'm sure you have seen during the week. Now, just for completeness, just for completeness the essence of the reconstruction by the Melokov and everyone is this map, which maps you from the, um, uh, from, from the uh, 3D coordinates to the ATS4 cross S1 coordinates, uh, the theta uh, representing that S1. Now, for the bilocal, this, um, this is the effective action. What then you do is that you look at the settled point approximation, meaning that you take a version of the effective action with respect to the, uh, to, to the bilocals, and then you can get a background uh, configuration. Once you get this background configuration, what you do then, you, you introduce your, your, your fluctuations, and then you expand about those uh, fluctuations, and then you extract the quadratic effective action. Um, it will be written in terms of some operator. Our goal then was try to invert that operator. Once we invert that operator, we find that the two time by local propagators given by that form. And um, another thing that we found is that the, the fluctuations obey an equation like that. And then that was the solution that we got. Now, for um, just to be precise, the bilocals can depend on the same time. Those, if they depend on the same time, I will call that single time by locals. And if they depend on two different times, then I will call those ones um, two times. So I first look at the time when the times are the same. Um, this is the collective Hamiltonian. You write it like that. Um, if you risk a of field psi by uh, n psi, this term will be subleading, and then you can you do the same variation that you did previously. You will find that the large n collective background is given by one over two square root of k squared. And you do the same thing, um, you play around with this, and then you will get an, an integral equation of this form. Um, for self consistent <coughs> what spectrum that we got previously, um, the, you have to have an equation of this form. And then we do the same thing again, we play around with it until we um, get the. The, the, the similar time uh, propagator it will create something of this form. Now, future directions in terms of our work, um, for example, the, the duality can be generalized. So you can couple Chen Simon's vector model and you get this ABJM duality. We want to have another systematic collective uh, bilocal approach to that kind of a problem. Um, um, there is a relationship between the, the theta violating parameter and the top coupling. We want to see if we can get uh, that result using relative field theory. And thank you. So, question? <laughs> I need at least one question. Anyone?
So is there anything else that you perhaps sort of long term long term into the future where you'd like this work to go? I know you said sort of things that you like um, to generalize. It, it, it goes back to um so for example if you look at what Mandelstam did, right, that the, the, there's this concept of uh um, but it was only done for lower dimensions. What this uh, higher spin actually does, it does is that it gives you, uh, it provides you with another example in three in three dimensions where you can have personalization. So uh, me and uh, Rotix, what we wanted to do was to have a look at this 3D personalization uh, uh, quality in terms of the collective health, meaning, meaning that we have to use those uh, collective by calls. If there's nothing else, let's thank Mabinello again. So I think perhaps it might be a good idea to have um, maybe five, ten minutes. So I guess let's let's start again at ten past twelve. All right. All right. Uh, so we continue with uh, Nathan. But just before he you know, gives us comments on scattering, um, there's um, an announcement that at 5.30 we'll meet um, in the lobby and then we'll go for the beach pride. Nathan? Yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys. Okay, so those of you who don't know, I'm Nathan. Uh, so I think you used to Jeff Morgan. And today I'm going to tell you some stuff about scattering amplitudes uh, in massive gravity. So, you might remember from Dan's talk, he said that amplitudes tend to have a slogan, which is that if you know the scattering amplitudes of the theory, you know everything there is to know about the theory. However, field theories, the kind that we're usually interested in, are given in terms of path intervals, and they have a host of very interesting features. For example, if you take the path interval formulation, you can find, you'll find anomalies, you'll find gauge symmetries, you find virtual particles. There are a whole bunch of theorems that you can derive, like the Landau-Yang theorem, Coleman-Mandula, Weinberg-Witten, spin statistics, etc. Um, there's the BDDBT discontinuity that I'm going to talk about. There's also the anomalous magnetic moment and the Higgs mechanism, and all these sorts of things. Now, if I was to just hand you a bunch of amplitudes, I'm going to claim that you can see all of those features that I just listed. And what we need to do that are the ingredients that Dan introduced to you earlier, which is the little group in order to fix three points. So in Dan's talk, the little group was U1, because he was just talking about massless particles. But I'm also going to be talking about massive particles, so I'm going to use SU2 to fix those. Um, as you saw, we need to complexify the momentum use all the tools of complex analysis um, and also locality which is going to boil down to unitarity and factorization in order to generate these high point amplitudes. And I want to stress there's no gauge symmetry, there's no virtual particles, there's no Lagrangian of any kind to speak of. So I'm going to talk about the VDBZ discontinuity. If you remember Taran's talk, um, he was looking at n equals 2 churn simons theory. And when he wanted to look at the massless limit, he just said, I'm just going to look at the massless amplitudes. Right. So it turns out that if you just take regular GR and you add a mass term and you compute perturbatively, you take the mass goes to zero, you're left over with this piece. Now this piece says that there's the scalar mode of the graviton and it couples to the trace of whatever stress energy tensor you happen to have in your theory. So we want to try and understand this via a scattering problem that we can construct using the ingredients that I just showed you. So we're going to compare these two amplitudes. On the left we have an amplitude exactly the same as the one that Diane introduced to you earlier. We have a photon going past some a uh, black hole or some star or whatever, exchanging a graviton. And on the right we have just two scalars exchanging a graviton. So they could just be two planets or whatever. So let's look at the all-scalar amplitude first. I told you that localization and factorization were going to be important. 
And that means that our amplitude has to factorize around a simple pole, um, and that we have to have two lower point amplitudes that are glued together to construct this amplitude. When Darn showed you this earlier, there were no indices, because he was looking at massless particles, for which the little group is U1. Now we need SU2 indices that we can hook onto in order to make sure that they obey all the mass symmetries that we need them to. So we can entirely fix this thing by from SU2 and dimensional analysis. And if we do that for this amplitude, and we end up taking the Newtonian limit, we find that essentially it's the limit that you would expect, good old Newtonian gravity, but now there's a fourth third factor in front of it. You say, okay, this is not quite right, but that's, that's fine, because I've only determined this up to some coupling constant, so I'll just redefine my coupling to be four thirds, whatever this incorrect coupling is. You say, okay. So now we're going to look at the scalar photon amplitude. Now, because of the Landau Yang theorem, and because the stress energy tensor for photons is traceless, we find that actually replacing this graviton with a massive graviton makes absolutely no difference to the amplitude uh, in the massless limit, it's exactly the same. Which means we should recover, if we calculate the, the scattering angle of a photon going past a star or something like that, we should recover exactly what Dan had. Except, because we've re-derived, because we've changed that coupling constant, the angle that we get, because it was proportional to G, is now going to be three quarters the angle that's predicted by regular GR. And this is the celebrated VDBZ discontinuity. So, how much time have I got? Five minutes, 37 seconds. You're in. That's how much you can say. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, the general way that you construct these amplitudes is you, um, you take a little group adapted variables, whatever they might be. Use all the symmetries to fix uh, to fix the form of that amplitude exactly as Darn did this talk. Um, and what we've been using in this uh, for this project has been adapted for massive particles. So it's easily applicable to uh, massive supersymmetry amplitudes. Although these haven't yet been computed as example, for example, you could use N equals four to the angles. There's this very bold proposal that it might be possible to somehow derive string theory. Because if you use the constraints um, that, that your amplitudes have to satisfy these group theory constraints, you'll find that you can't have higher spin massive particles. They cannot be elementary, so they'll have to be composite, or you need an infinite tau of them, which is exactly what you're talking about. So that's an interesting goal. Um, that should definitely say construct. <laughs> uh, construct massive twisted space is another interesting goal. Um, to look at all of this stuff in additional dimensions other than four. Um, and also, unlike in Dan's talk where he was talking about using recursion relations, no such thing currently exists for uh, this massive construction. So we would hope that at some point we can go beyond uh, four points using by deriving some kind of recursion relation. Any questions? Well, I'll leave this up to anyone who's talking about this. Any questions for Nathan? The graviton mass term that you consider, is it like, like to do some sort of like diffeomorphism breaking by adding some extra? Yeah. So you, you, you break the few and variance by essentially adding m squared h squared to the einstein hilbert action. But then you typically look at it for terms of So this was just looking at the first order tree level stuff. Obviously you can look at the is, higher order. Is this discontinuity in that any way related to the fact that you know when you have a massive graviton, you have more propagating degrees of freedom as compared to when yes. you have just two? Yes. Okay. So it's the fifth propagating degree of freedom that doesn't disappear in the massless limits. Is there a way of doing this that, you know, adding a mass term for graviton in a way that, you know, which doesn't add this extra degree of freedom? Um, so there are ways of screening um, the discontinuity because it's, it's actually only present in there. So for example, 
if you take the sitter space, there's no such discontinuity. Everything's fine. Um, you can also just look at the higher point um, nonlinear parts, and they will also screen some of this Feinstein screen. Um, and that also gets rid of your discontinuity for you. Well, it screens your discontinuity for you until you sit in some particular rate. Just one, one more question. The factorization that you were using in, in BTFW thing, is it known that it, or is it expected that it, it will hold even for loop level amplitudes? Um, for tree level, it's basically obvious because it comes from the propagator, the inside propagator. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But at loop level, um, is so, so the short answer is no, but the long answer is yes with lots of caveats. So that, that comes back to having to, so, Unitarity can fix a lot about the amplitudes for you, and even in the even in the massive case, this is also true. But naively, no, you can't just say oh, I will definitely factorize into this some set of factors. <coughs> but there are ways to constrain it so that you can build yeah massive into whatever. Right, I think let's leave it there. Let's Our next speaker is Randall, and um, start when you are ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, so um, I'll be speaking on integrability and n equals two superconformal theories. Uh, this is a project that I'm doing with my supervisor, uh, Professor Zobos, and Eli, uh, Eli Pony. Uh, right, so let me first start off by giving some motivation and a bit of background theory. Uh, so integrability was discovered in four-dimensional planar n equals four super young rolls to one loop uh, by Menahan and Zarembo. Um, and sort of the very basic rough idea is that the problem of determining the eigenvalues for the dilatation operator on some single trace operators can be mapped to a problem of determining uh, the energy eigenvalues for the Hamiltonian of uh, some spin chain, Heisenberg spin chain. And uh, thankfully for us, uh, Vita, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Johannes Beta solved this problem uh, a long time ago for the spectrum uh, in terms of these famous beta equations. Um, but one can ask, what about more realistic theories? And what I mean by realistic theories is in the sense of less supersymmetry. Um, does integrability survive if we break the um, supersymmetry somehow? And if it doesn't, um, what is breaking it? Uh, and perhaps ultimately we could say things about th uh, things like non-perturbative QCD. Okay. Uh, and so uh, towards this end, uh, a step in that direction is to study a family of four-dimensional n equals two superconformal theories. Uh, which is obtained by orbifolding n equals four super young moles. Okay, so to break the R symmetry, uh, you under this orbifold action, uh, we use a discrete group uh, Z two. So uh, these orbifold theories under some zk, you can study it as well. Uh, was studied by Douglas and Moore. Um, so I'm not going to say too much about that because it's all monopoly of things you can say about it. Uh, but the basic uh, take-home points that I want to give is that under the action of Z two. Uh, our R symmetry uh, is broken to SU2 R cross uh, U1 little r. Uh, and also there is an action of Z2 inside the gauge group, which this 2 is just for convenience, uh, but it breaks it into a product of gauge groups, which I will distinguish um, using check uh, indices. Uh, and when you write down your Lagrangian for your theory now, you have two gauge couplings, G and G check, corresponding to the product gauge group. Uh, and they're both exactly marginal, so we can deform our theory um, in a nice fashion, a nice continuous fashion, without breaking the formal symmetry. Um, just to say something quick about the n equals 4 vector multiplet, uh, it breaks down under the action of Z2 into this whole array of fields, which I'm not going to say too much about either as well. The important ones are the phi's and the q's, the, uh, the scalars. Um, what I do want to say is that supersymmetry then neatly combines uh, these fields into and two n equals two vector multiplets and two n equals two by fundamental uh, hypermultiplets. Um, the index structure here is much more complicated now because we have these two gauge groups. Um, so writing down single trace operators for eventually for our spin chain becomes a complicated, more complicated task at least. Uh, 
So this is a legal single trace operator that I've written down um, under the trace. Uh, of course, combining a phi and a phi check um, wouldn't work. There would be no way to trace it. Okay, and so this is just sort of a, a, a map of the idea of varying the um, two gauge couplings. Um, I should mention that at the orbifold, fold, um, the gauge couplings are precisely equal to each other. Um, we can then vary them without breaking superconformal uh, symmetry to get some interpolating theory where they're not equal. And finally, we can set one of them, say G-check, um, we can send to zero to obtain an N equals two superconformal QCD. And if I just go one back, um, these gauge this gauge index essentially becomes a global symmetry, an extra global symmetry, uh, which can be combined with this pi hat index, which is just an extra leftover global symmetry from the R symmetry breaking, um, to combine that to, to get a, a symmetry flavor enhancement. Okay, um, so, Looking then at this, at this family of n equal to CFTs, we can start thinking about integrability. And if I start here at the orbifold point, um, integrable structures have indeed been identified, and you can see that in this paper by Weizert and Roybein. Um, and at the other side of uh, the extreme, uh, the integrable properties were studied by Hade and others, and uh, I believe that they did see at least some hints of uh, integrability down there, but what I am ultimately interested in here is the interpolating theory, which I will say now uh, more of it in a second. Okay, so uh, a good test, at least of integrability, uh, is to see if the S matrix satisfies the Yang Baxter equation, uh, which is a necessary but, okay, although not sufficient condition. Um, and similar to the N equals 4 case, we need to identify a vacuum since we need to build spin chains now. Um, and we identify a closed scalar um, subsector with these quantum numbers. And in this theory, we have two different BPS conditions. So the BPS conditions to simply imply that the conformal symmetry of these operators uh, that I've written here uh, is protected from um, loop corrections, which the spin chain statement is that um, it's the state of zero energy under the Hamiltonian. Okay, um, so. If I look quickly, um, I have a degenerate um, vacuum here, if I choose this as my vacuum. Excitations, for instance, could be two Qs, a Q and a Q tilde. And what's interesting here is that the um, excitations interpolates between the two vacuums. Okay? Um, for the second one, um, this vacuum is unique up to choice of the I and the I hat indices. Um, we chose all of them plus. And uh, excitations are simply given by phi and phi j. Okay. And then just to briefly show you, this is the interpolating Hamiltonian that was calculated in the paper by Rostelli. Um, the Ks are the trace operators, P are the permutation operators, uh, okay, which I will just leave at that, which we can then calculate things from. And just to jump to the punch, uh, the phi vacuum um, in the interpolating um, theory was found by Rostelli to not satisfy the young baxter equation uh, in the sector. But when we go to G-check equal to zero, um, it is satisfied again. So a uh, good question is sort of why this is happening. And um, we believe that, um, per, that actually the Young-Baxter e equation is in a sense satisfied in the sense of a twisted Young-Baxter equation, that to say something about integrability now is too soon. Okay, so just briefly some of our results that we've also been looking at. We studied the Q vacuum. This is the two uh, Magnon ansatz. Um, it's a bit more complicated due to index structure, but okay, it's got some nice properties that the energy is additive. Uh, we calculated the S matrix, it runs off the page, I couldn't fit it onto the slide. Uh, but uh, it's got some nice properties as well. Uh, it's got the unitary property at the orbit fault, it reduces to N equals 4, uh, the triple X uh, S matrix. We get this bonus E2 symmetry, and trivially, it satisfies the Young Baxter equation because it's a one by one matrix. So we can't say much about integrability at this point, but a good uh, extra step would be to look at the three body uh, problem and see if it decomposes into two. Uh, so just again, we need to look at the phi vacuum again, check for twisted Yang Baxter equation before we make any big results. Uh, and we're also interested in the algebraic structure of the theory in the sense of what survives uh, as we're deforming this theory in terms of, we're thinking in the sense of quantum groups and alpha algebras, but that's something for another time. Thank you. <laughs> marathon, okay. Uh, yeah. Question? What is the global symmetry of the uh, interpolating theory? Um, so it is a SU2 symmetry. Um, in the study paper, when they're breaking the R symmetry, they look at an SU2 cross SU2 cross U1 subgroup. 
and then with the Z2, they basically project out um, the supercharges corresponding to the one SU2. Um, and this index then, that I had the index, uh, simply becomes this extra global symmetry. It's not related to the R symmetry, um, which I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, yes. Okay. So it's sort of like a flavor symmetry. Uh, no, it should be super one bro. Like OSD 4 slash 2 or SU 4 slash 2. Oh, oh, I'm not sure about that. We can maybe speak about it afterwards if you want, but yeah, I'm not too sure about it. All right, let's leave it there. Thank you. Um, Sean? Second year PhD student at the University of Rotterdam. My supervisor is Professor Robert Demelikov, and today I'll be telling you about my work, the construction of the emergent Yang Mills theory. So, what is the main aim? Is to construct this emergent Yang Mills theory that is due to the low energy description of open string excitations and giant graviton brains. And we make use of the spin chain description of the CFT operators. Why would we do that? Well, it's a very effective approach to the planar limit of the super Yang Mills theory. And this description maps each CFT operator to the state of a spin chain and the dilatation operator to the Hamiltonian of the spin chain. And the dynamics of the spin chain are naturally described in terms of excitations known as Magnol. So we have evaluated the action of the one loop dilatation operator in two in the SU3 sector, uh, and we see it has the mixing of the Y and Z fields, the X and Z fields, and the Y and X fields. And we initially uh, acted with this operator in a restricted show polynomial basis. So here we have our restricted show polynomial. And on the right, the first one to talk about the product, our fields, the X product, the Y product, and the Z product. We have P, X fields, M, Y fields and NZ fields. The sum of X and Y fields are a lot less than the number of Z fields. And the order of the X and Y fields are the same, so the ratio is of order one. Um, we have the summation over the permutation of the, the symmetric group SN plus M plus P. We have our label capital R, which partitions N plus M plus P diagrams. We have our low case labels R, S, T, which respectively partition uh, N diagrams, P, uh, N, N diagrams, M diagrams, and P diagrams. And once we had gotten a result in that basis, we improved it by going to the gauss graph basis. And in this basis, the result is diagonalized over some irreducible representation labels. And what we have it in some type of form, as we see over here, we, we have the capital R and the lowercase r label, and we have over some permutation sigma. And on the right, we have this n, which is a normalization factor, and before our restricted short colonial basis. And keep in mind that the sigma is in the double coset, as seen on the right, and h is then sub symmetric. So a number of things I want to note is that in our work we were mainly focusing on the subleading piece that is the mixing of the X and Y fields. Now, those are small deformations of the half BPS operators and in the past um, these were neglected but you should note that depending on how many X and Y fields you have in your theory it comes to a point that you can no longer neglect it. And I'm sure you know a lot of concepts uh, that we were using come from group and group and representation theory, such as Young diagrams, Young evolutionary symbols, the restricted shores, the intertwiners, projection operators, just to name a few. 
And once we had a general result, we want to then consider the large end limits and we make use of an approximation or the distinct or the displaced corners approximation. And computations that are made in the Gauss graph basis, they can be made more precise with the help of Gauss graphs. So to give you an idea, unfortunately I didn't put any illustrations, but the giant graviton bands can be thought of as dots and the open strings are these lines connecting between these dots. And an equivalent way of representing it is when you're looking at a young diagram that each row represents a brain and the movement of boxes at the end of these rows would be then the strings going from one brain to another. Now, last week Tuesday, myself, my supervisor and a former colleague who had just submitted his PhD at the end of last year have submitted this paper to the archive titled Nominous Dimensions from Boson Lattice Models. And what it entails is a quick step-by-step -step review of work that has been done in the past, but then we definitely showed some novel work. And what we had done then, we had to take careful cases and show that we could take this massive result and reduce it further to something that makes more sense. And the idea of diagonalizing our result can also be thought of a system of bosons that are hopping on a lattice. So future work, well we intend to study the SG22 group, its algebra and its connection to magnets. Well, we do that because we want to gain an insight to the low level description of the super angles theory. But keep in mind that this group involves fermions which is not what we had previously, so that's what we want to consider as we move forward in our work. And when you study the supergroups and superalgebra, it determines uh, your work to determine the nominous dimensions of this SU22 group and the magnet scattering matrix. And later on, we want to look at the gravity theory, uh, consider the nine plus one dimensional metric in action. And that will help us build an understanding of the open strings that are attached to the S3 or the volume. And it will help us to think about the magnet bound states that we are studying. So I'd like to thank you for your time, your attention, and for this opportunity. Any questions for Sean? Okay, I'll shoot. Um, why do you study restricted show polynomials? So you are studying super young mills theory in a particular sector? Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, but you end up studying restricted show polynomials. Yes. How do you get there? I'll well, say so the reason we study that is because it uh, helps us with the understanding of the <coughs> strings excitations uh, and the connection to uh, open, uh, to the giant graviton brains. It has, it's a nice representation that helps us see the inner workings and the connection to this picture. Any other questions? Well, I have a question. So, you were saying that there was some ambiguity or something unprecise in the previous work, which has been become more precise in this work. Uh, uh, yeah. Talking about the looking at the subleading. Yeah, but I, I, that's very vague understanding. What did you make it more precise? What what must become uh, more precise? So, the pure half DPS uh, sector you look at, there are no X fields. There are no Y fields, there are some Z fields. And obviously, the inclusion of the X and Y fields, the impurities, and because we have the mixing of the X and Ys, it's extremely small in comparison to the mixing of the others that involve Z fields. And you would naturally think, because the order is so small, it has no contribution to the leading order result but we've seen that, that it comes to a point with the amount that you, amount of X and Y fields that you add in, the result can no longer be ignored. There is some contribution that's uh, substantial coming from a subleading term. Subleading means one way. Say again? Subleading means subleading in one way. Yes. So you're saying that you can transfer up to any finite 
pi over nc. Let's thank Sean again. show is Yannick and um, we can start when you are ready. Uh, good day, my name is Yannick Mondouche. I'm a PhD student at the University of Pretoria under the supervision of Professor Constantino Zoukas. The title of my project, PhD project, is Logarithmic, Logarithmic Conform of Your Theories, W Algebras and Holography. So what I'm going to do is just break down this title into its three different components. Starting from um, why the L next to CFT, and then uh, why uh, holography, saying a tiny bit about uh, why holography, giving some results, and uh, as I'm uh, speaking about further uh, future work, motivate why the W algebras appear um, in the title. So why, uh, why LCFTs? When we, when we think of uh, rational CFTs uh, and their representation theory, we can think of those theories as construct constructed by, uh, in terms of um, uh, highest weight representations of uh, the Virasoro algebra. And um, highest weight states uh, um, satisfying these, uh, these equations. Now, there are theories with additional fields um, such that the um, Hamiltonian of those fields uh, does not, do not diagonalize anymore. And these fields seem to um, uh, partner with uh, other fields of same conformal uh, dimension. Now, uh, this marks the appearance of Jordan cells uh, which you can see here, which are uh, salient features of logarithmic conformal field theories. Now, why uh, the partner is logarithmic? Uh, this is because when computing uh, the two-point correlation functions of uh, these fields, um, well, we see appearing some logarithmic singularities. So in 1993, Victor Gurari decided to coin these uh, theories logarithmic conformal field theories. So that's about it for uh, LCFTs in a nutshell. And um, why now uh, holography? Well, it turns out that the, the, these LCFTs have uh, jewels on the gravity side. Those are, those are massive uh, uh, gravities, and topologically massive gravity, new massive gravities, uh, generalized uh, massive gravities. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, dwell much on those. Um, because of the motivation of um, the project, which comes now. Um, there was a paper written by Grumiller and uh, friends in uh, 19, uh, 2013 uh, that states that up to that point, ADS, uh, LCFT, uh, had been used in one direction, so taking the knowledge uh, from LCFT and see what can be uh, learned on, uh, for these uh, gravity theory, uh, on the gravity theories. And they also suggested that it would be interesting to do it the other way around. So basically, uh, taking results from uh, those uh, massive gravities and see what can be learned on the LCFT side. So this is uh, what I'm interested in. So I, I, I see more on the uh, CFT side than on the gravity side. And uh, so uh, that was the starting point for us. And uh, we started by looking at the partition function of uh, the, the graviton partition function of topologically massive gravities. So um, this was computed in 2010 by Gabardiel, Rumiller, and Vesilevich. And this is how it looks like. And it was given a CFT interpretation, which appears here. So now, in this case, uh, on the gravity side, the graviton has a logarithmic partner. And this reflects on the CFT side by the um, uh, energy momentum tensor having a logarithmic partner as well. So. What we did is that we took uh, the partition function, we split it in two blocks, A and B, and B is a block uh, that uh, uh, brings a contribution of the um, logarithmic partner. So we showed that uh, actually this block can be expressed as a generating function of Bell polynomials. And these are the Bell polynomials, the y-ns, 
uh, multivariate Delta polynomials with uh, variables G1, G2, up to Gn. And then uh, it was easy to verify that um, doing it in that way, while well, we obtain the same result as in that paper, but the multi-particle sector of uh, the uh, logarithmic, logarithmic partner comes ordered. And uh, in that sense, we kind of addressed already one issue um, um, mentioned in that paper of in 2013, which is uh, talking about the combinatorics of uh, the multi-particle sector. So uh, in addition to that, uh, we can also uh, mention a few results. Uh, it is possible also to, cre to create raising and lowering operators that satisfy the heisenberg bell algebra, and uh, they act on those Bell polynomials. And even to go further uh, from these uh, operators and construct some uh, operators that uh, satisfy the SL2 al algebra and that also act on Bell polynomials. So um, all this is uh, actually um, encoded in these pictures, which is where actually I see the, the beauty of the work. <coughs> But my supervisor is always there to remind me that uh, beauty is not enough and not in mathematics and uh, some uh, physical interpretation of things is always needed. So while thinking about that, we also look beyond. And uh, one interesting question is, uh, what happens, what would happen on the LCFT side if we add uh, extra uh, higher spin uh, fields on the gravity side? So uh, the partition function was computed for topology topologically massive higher spin gravities, in this case, in 2011. And uh, what we can see that it kind of looks a bit uh, involved already. So the best thing is to try to work um, uh, step by step and uh, see what happens on the TMG uh, LCFT side if we add just a spin three um, higher spin on the gravity side. The partition function will look like this, where we recognize the contribution from uh, TMG by itself, and the extra contribution of what of the um, um, logarithmic partner of the spin three field. So um, why uh, W algebra in the in the title? Because adding uh, extra spin, uh, higher spin fields on the gravity side changes the symmetry algebra on the LCFT side from Virasoro to W. And this is actually visible if we bring uh, these two guys together like this, we end up um, already having the vacuum um, um, character of the W3 algebra. Uh, so we'd like to, uh, we hope to be able to say a few things about that uh, in the future. And lastly, uh, we'd like to also investigate um, um, a possible uh, correlation between what we're doing and quantum groups acting on um, LCFTs. There was a paper last year by Simon Lentner that speaks about, um, among other things, um, a relationship between half algebras and uh, some functions um, in several variables. What is interesting for me is that the appearance of a differential operator of um, polynomial uh, nature that acts on some objects and gives exactly the same sequence uh, that we had with the Bell polynomials. So we'd like to be able to see if there is uh, some possible you know, connection between uh, those quantum groups that act on the LCFTs and whatever we have before. So that's about it. Um, we hope to see it, to say a bit more in the future. Uh, some references. Uh, thank you very much. Right. Any questions? Perhaps a starting point, but I'm not. I'm not actually, I didn't dwell very uh, that much on the gravity side, so yeah, I'm not too sure about it. It's just a kernel. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So it's the same. It's you yeah. in quantum gravity, and then you do the fluctuation determinant from that. Same it, yeah, it's very it's quite the same. Apply to the theory. You said that. Uh, that if you look the partition function of this uh, topological high. That's the highest thing. Mm -hmm. You're able to see the W algebra or whatever. 
what our W thing was. We saw that the vacuum character appeared, but the rest of the partition function, I imagine that if the W symmetry is there, the rest of it should also be written in some characters of uh, W thing, right? Uh, is yeah, and um, well, actually, already uh, not even going to um, um, uh, the W algebra, uh, it seems a bit uh, difficult to be able to identify, you know, the the the, the part of the logarithmic logarithmic partner with, uh, let's say, cache characters or I mean characters uh, in the Virasoro characters, basically. So it's something also that we are thinking about looking at, but that is what one would expect yeah, even on the but for like the non higher spin gravity, just the ordinary gravity, massive gravity thing, yeah. uh, you were able to write down everything in terms of the characters of uh, your symmetry algebra, this logarithmic thing, right? Was that true? Or uh, that well, true? What, what, what we're able to see is, um, yeah, at this stage. Uh, uh, Are you talking about just a uh, higher spin or even before? Yeah, so this one you said that the. The vacuum character appears and the rest is there. Yes. Uh, I was just expecting that this rest should also be able to, you should also be able to write as characters of this W algebra. Um, but this you say that is for now we don't know. Yeah, for now we don't know. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it would be nice if um, it happens and right. we're still busy looking at it as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Should we thank Yannick? So while Inkulu, Leko, and I um, chat, can we maybe send you guys out to finish the snacks um, <laughs> if they have not already been finished? And um, let's say maybe maximum 10 minutes, all right? So we'll try and make it as quick as possible, but 10 minutes time. Um, so yeah, let's say 1 o'clock, um, yeah, we can just reconvene for a few minutes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.